Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better nurse. Today, we are going over asthma exacerbation, including what it is, patient presentation, questions you need to be asking, and the treatments commonly used in the ER. So, asthma is a respiratory condition characterized by inflammation, bronchoconstriction, and mucus production. And an exacerbation is a, is a severe case of asthma that can lead to hypoxic respiratory failure and or hy hypercapnic respiratory failure. With hypoxic failure, the lungs are unable to oxygenate due to the bronchoconstriction, whereas in hypercapnic failure, the lungs are unable to exhale carbon dioxide. These make sense, right? The patient feels short of breath because they can not get air in as well as they normally can from the bronchoconstriction, the inflammation, and the mucus. Then, on top of it, they can't get that same air out because of the same things, the bronchoconstriction, the inflammation, and the mucus production. Many times when your patient comes in really sick, they won't be able to answer your questions from how short of breath they are. But general questions that you want to ask ask them which if it's not going to be the patient it can be ems or family members these questions are going to be what are the possible triggers that could have triggered this asthma exacerbation when did the symptoms of a shortness of breath start have they been taking their medications like they're supposed to be how many treatments per day have they been taking since the shortness of breath started and when was the last treatment and then another very important question that you need to ask is, has the patient ever been intubated or ever been admitted to the ICU? Triggers commonly include coldness, smoking, allergies, allergies, uh, viral illnesses, and even stress can cause it. You want to know if they've been taking their medications because if they haven't, that tells you that that may be the cause. You ask how many treatments per day if they have been intubated or have ever been admitted to the ICU to get a feel for their severity. For example, if they have been giving themselves treatments nonstop and they have a history of getting intubated, it signals that your patient usually requires the highest level of care, meaning you have to act quick to stabilize your patient. So a mild asthma exacerbation can present with shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheezing on auscultation, usually still awake and able to speak. However, with a severe exacerbation, there is going to be little air movement on auscultation. So there's not going to be uh, any wheezing present because there's no air moving from how bronchoconstricted they are. Your patient is going to be very altered. They're going to be cyanotic. And in a sense, they're going to be tiring out from how fast they've been breathing and from the lack of oxygen that they're getting and that buildup of uh, carbon dioxide in their body. And then if you want to get a more in-depth in um, review of a respiratory assessment, I'm going to attach my video here for it. So just check it out if you want to. So providers are going to want to roll out other things too, right? But as far as asthma, the diagnosis for them, from my understanding, is just based on the history and the physical. Usually labs and radiology are not needed, but if there is a doubt or there are findings on the physical exam that suggest another etiology, not just asthma or something completely different from asthma, the workup will be completed. So some other conditions that have similar presentations to asthma include CHF, COPD, pneumonia, a pulmonary embolism, anaphylaxis, croup, and bronchiolitis. A CBC can help look for the presence of an infection like pneumonia. A chest x-ray can help with a pneumonia or with CHF, and an ECG can help assess for a cardiac etiology. However, a straightforward asthma exacerbation may not need all of this, as a simple bedside ultrasound by your ER provider can give plenty of information on the lungs and the heart. So, the goals of treatment include reversing the hypoxia, the bronchospasm, and the inflammation, which, as we discuss, are the key characteristics of asthma. So for hypoxia, you must place your patient on oxygen, whether this is going to be a nasal cannula, a non-rebreather, BiPAP, or even intubation, right? We are talking about BiPAP and intubation in one of the upcoming slides, so just hold on for that. So besides oxygen, the most important aspect of treatment is opening up the lungs, which if because if they don't open up, it won't matter what medications or how much oxygen you give them, 
it's not going to get in, right? So albuterol is going to be the go-to beta-2 agonist because it produces bronchodilation. It works best when it's nebulized, so that's why they breathe it in. So typically, they're going to do 2.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams every 15 minutes as needed. But if it's severe enough, a continuous treatment can be given not to exceed 15 milligrams per hour. Keep in mind, the symptoms of albuterol include nervousness, shakiness, hypokalemia, and tachycardia. So when more and more albuterol is being given, you as a nurse just keep an eye on the heart rate. In combination with albuterol, a protropium, an anticholinergic, gets given at the same time as it also helps with bronchodilation. Typical dosing is 0.5 milligrams, not to exceed 1.5 milligrams. And then, ultimately, to help with the inflammation that's going on inside the lungs, a steroid is given. Methylprednisolone is usually given IV and prednisone is PO. However, sick patients who are really short of breath can't swallow, so the IV route is commonly selected. These first three that we talked about are the key components, oxygen, a breathing treatment consisting of albuterol and ipratropium and a steroid. Next in line for treatments is magnesium, which promotes bronchodilation by relaxing bronchial smooth muscle. Typically, it's going to be 2 grams IV over 20 minutes. Another medication that can also be considered on top of everything is epinephrine. However, as we know, it's going to affect every single receptor, not just beta 2. So besides bronchodilation, it can lead to cardiac arrhythmias and other complications. But if it is chosen as an add-on therapy, if the others haven't worked, you may be giving 0.3 milligrams IM or even starting them on a small dose of an epi infusion. But keep in mind that the dosing that we just talked about is going to be very different for your pediatric patients. So don't get that confused. Verify with your pharmacist to make sure that you get the right medications for pediatric patients. On the right, you have a handheld nebulizer which is what we typically use for adults so that they can actively participate with their treatment. The mask on the left is what we typically use for pediatric patients, as you can see on the bottom left photo right here. This small container that's the same on both is where the medications are going to go. So you mix the albuterol and the ipratropium and add a few mLs of normal saline within this small container. Then you connect the tubing up to the oxygen, turn it up to six to eight liters, and you have the patient take slow, deep breaths through their mouth. While this is going on, while the patient is doing their treatment, you can do other stuff, like get other medications ready, right? Like the steroids, the magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how the handheld nebulizer comes in in the package. And then these are all the parts from the handheld nebulizer next to each other, right? So starting from the left, you have the T connector, then you have the mouthpiece, you have the container where all the medications go into, then the reservoir and the tubing. So this is the container where you would mix the albuterol and the ipratropium in, and this is where you would add the, some NS drops so that you end up with approximately four to five mLs. And the container right here, just simply, it you just unscrew it off, put the medications on, and then screw it back on, and then just don't tilt it, or like tilt it upside down because the medication will fall out. You just unscrew it, put medications in, and screw it back on, right? And then after you do that with the medications, you put the T connector on, you put the mouthpiece on, then you connect the reservoir, connect the tubing, and then connect the tubing up to the oxygen and turn it up to six to eight liters. So now let's talk about BiPAP and intubation. So as always, if there are clear indications that your patient needs to be intubated, it should not be delayed because when delayed, complications are more likely to occur. If you want to know more about rapid sequence intubation, I'm going to tag my video here. So BiPAP is a form of non-invasive ventilation applied through a mask. Your ER provider may decide to give a trial of BiPAP as it can help by reducing the work of breathing through its ability to recruit collapsed alveoli and improve ventilation. But the issue is that your patient must be awake and alert enough to be able to take their mask off and if need be, right? And typically when asthmatics are really sick, it may not be appropriate to use BiPAP and instead go straight for RSI. But if the patient is on the fence, a short trial of like 30 minutes, with you having the ability to stay at bedside to closely monitor your patient may be done. If it works, 
If it improves your patient's respiratory, respiratory status, intubation can be avoided as a whole, right? But you must be able to stay at bedside and you need to have all necessary supplies for rapid sequence intubation ready just in case. Know that a small dose of ketamine may be given in order to kind of just relax your patient. But it can do more than just relax your patient. So why it is, that's why it is so important that you have all your other equipment readily available in case the patient does get intubated. If your patient is going to be intubated off the bat or overall, ketamine or etominate may, may be chosen as induction agents. I'm going to tag my RSI medications video here. So simply ketamine has bronchodilatory effects while etominate is very hemodynamically stable. The key thing with intubation in asthmatics is that the vent settings must be set to allow for adequate expiration. If you remember, asthmatics have a difficulty exhaling all the air that they breathe in. So if nothing is done, it keeps building up and up, leading to increases in intrathoracic pressures, which this increase in intrathoracic pressures affects blood return back to the heart. And if there's not enough blood going to the heart, there's not going to be enough blood leaving the heart. So that leads to hypotension. And on top of this, the pressure within the lungs can even lead to a normal thorax. So let's talk about some nursing specific things, right? If your ER has RTs designated, let them know. Notify them of your super sick asthma patient. They are pros when it comes to when it comes to anything respiratory. Learn from them. With that being said, they may not be readily available. So even though I briefly covered how to do a breathing treatment, try and learn how to do one on the job. Ask an RT whenever you see one if they can show you where all the supplies are and how to hook them up and how to perform a treatment. The ER is not a competition. As I keep saying, teamwork makes the dream work. So learn from each other. Next, perhaps the most important nursing specific tip is to continuously monitor your patient. When the patient first arrives, there's going to be probably a bunch of people in the room helping you out, but they leave as soon as the patient gets settled in. So it falls on you as the nurse to continuously monitor your patient. Do they feel better after the treatment? Do their lungs sound better? Are they speaking better? Do you notice a decreased worker breathing or are they increasingly more altered? Do you notice decreasing air movement on auscultation? Perhaps they're desatting. It's your duty to stay on top of it and to notify the rest of the team so more interventions can be implemented. We talked about it, but keep at the back of your mind that your intubated asthma patients are at an increased risk for a pneumothorax related to the buildup of air and pressure within the lungs, and they're also at an increased risk of hypotension related to the pressure within the intrathoracic cavity as it affects the blood return back to the heart. So if your patient suddenly becomes unstable, whether their blood pressure begins to drop or they start desanding, keep these things at the back of your mind. So now let's go for the question of the day. What is the dosing of ibuprofen in pediatric patients? So as always, it's going to be at the bottom of the description text, but I hope that you know this if you're graduated from nursing school but if you don't it's okay as i keep saying it's never wrong it's i highly recommend that you ask when you don't know something and then as always i think that being a good ear nurse depends a lot on your experiences and taking the time up to familiarize yourself and look up topics that you don't fully understand i have listed my favorite er nursing related books in the comments and i think you're going to greatly benefit from them if you learned something uh, from this video today, I would appreciate a, a like and a follow and share it with your friends. And then if you have anything that you would like me to cover in the future, please comment. All the comments that I, that people have put, I am putting them on a list and I'm getting to them little by little. So I really appreciate that for giving me ideas for future videos. And then I also have a, a link in the description for a Redbubble little uh, store that I have. There's like stickers and shirts on there if you want to check them out. And then as always, as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive and not reactive. Thank you, guys.